Today on the show, frequent guest and friend of the show, Corbin Smith of All Seahawks and Locked on Seahawks is going to be sharing his latest post-combine mock draft. And of all the mock drafts I've seen and all the mock drafts I've done, this one stood out to me as one where the process and the results were impressive. I think it's realistic. I think you're going to like it. It's got a couple curveballs in there. Can't wait to get your thoughts. Corbin Smith shares his latest mock draft with us today on Seahawks Forever. Welcome to the Seahawks Forever podcast. In-depth analysis on everything Seahawks. And now, here's your host, Dan Viennes. Be sure to hit that like button, subscribe to the YouTube channel, and hit the bell so you're always notified of new episodes. If you prefer audio podcasts, you can listen to the show on any platform, but on Spotify, you can subscribe for less than a dollar a month at the moment and listen to ad-free episodes exclusively. And if you want to just support me and the show, you can buy me a coffee at the link in the description. Let's, uh, let's not waste any time today. Let's get right into this Corbin Smith uh, beat writer for the Seahawks, one of the hardest working guys out there. Um, it's been fun to watch his ascent, uh, kind of starting off as a guy who did film breakdowns on Twitter and then uh, worked it into where he is one of the, the best beat writers out there, in my opinion. Um, Corbin shares his latest mock draft with us today. Be prepared to jump into the comments and give me your thoughts, whether we Agree or disagree, you hate the picks, love the picks, have some other ideas. I love mock drafting, and I love your input and engagement on that. So can't wait to hear what you think of this. Here is Corbin Smith. All right, Corbin, thanks for taking the time to join the show again. I can't wait to dig into this draft because, well, I'll tell you why in a minute, but uh, let's start off this way. Tell me about your process heading into this, and then I know there's a couple of trades here. How'd you get this all set up to start? So I know a lot of people out there throw together 20, 30 mock drafts during the off season. And for me, and there's nothing wrong with that, but for me, I do four or five of them and there's a very systematic process to it. I do one after the senior bowl. That is always the first one that I do. And then I have one pre-combine and post-combine because there's a lot that I learn when I'm on the ground in Indianapolis and then I have a post free agency and I have a post by or not by week, a post uh, pro day one that I now mix in because so many guys don't do workouts at the combine. And then there's all the different meetings that take place. And so I really try to zero in as the process goes on. If you look at my mock drafts, there are a few guys we'll talk about today that have been on several of mine because I am sure. just thoroughly convinced that the Seahawks, if they have a chance to pick that guy at a certain spot, they will go after him. Last year, Devin Witherspoon was a guy that I picked several times with mm -hmm. the number five overall selection and got a lot of laughs about that. And then look what happened. So not toot my own horn, but the pro there's a process that I go through. I look at scheme fits a little different this year with Mike McDonald now being the head coach, but I look at scheme fit. I look at the personnel groupings that they're going to be using. I look at the visits, the meetings that they've had. And I take some of the information that I got on the ground in Indy, from people that were the senior bowl. And I try to apply all that stuff into using their historical data as well to try to put together a draft that I think is realistic. And it's hard with these mock draft simulators, as you know, Dan, there's going to be guys available at certain picks that you're thinking there's no way in hell that guy is available. And I try to eliminate those players when I'm making selections and make yeah. it as realistic as I can based on where I'm projecting guys are going to fall. Yeah, that is, that is the challenge. And even if you try to account for it, as you did and as I try to do, by not taking that player, it still means that another player was taken, right, that maybe normally wouldn't have. What what I liked about this draft, what stood out that that made me want to have you on the show and, and dive a little deeper into it is what you just touched on, is what I view to be the a realistic process. It, it fits need. It seems to fit Seahawks style of of the type of player that they go after the type of person they go after scheme fits etc um and it starts at the top with a player that i haven't taken in any of my mock simulations we'll get to him in a second but you trade down to begin with all the way to 28 take advantage of that buffalo bills team that is bereft of wide receiver talent i assume that's what you're you're thinking they might move all the way up to 16 and get aggressive to do you move down to 28 how did that trade shake out 
So this is one of those situations where every time we look at the first round in any NFL draft, there's fluidity based on what happens in those first 10 to 15 picks. But I'm looking at the way things are setting up. And John Schneider, he has got to have a smile that is truly going ear to ear right now because you just look at the teams in the back part of that first round. So many of them are either needing tackle help or they're needing receiver help or both. The Dallas Cowboys are going to be desperate to add tackles because they lost Tyron Smith in free agency, let him go to the Jets. You've got teams like the Detroit Lions, who I think might view themselves as one player away from being a Super Bowl winner. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of team that could make a big jump and give up a second round pick as well to move up and get that missing piece that could get them over the hump. And then you get teams like Buffalo and Kansas City at 32 that I could see both those teams offering a King's ransom of sorts to move up to go get a pass catcher because both those teams could use pass catchers, especially Buffalo after getting rid of Stefan Diggs. So that's how I set this trade up. But moving down from number 16 to 28, that is a big drop off. Yeah. And I think that Seattle can get both a second and potentially a third. But in this case, I got the second round pick and I was able to add another day three selection that I used later to trade, which John Snyder has done many times during right. his career. But get pick number 60 so that Seattle has another bite of the apple on day two. And it's interesting. You can start to connect some dots. You know, the closer we get to the draft, the more intel some of these, you know, big time analysts, guys that do what you do and spend every day doing it, start to be able to piece the puzzle together a little bit more accurately. Field Yates tweeted the other day that teams in that 15 to 18 range where the Seahawks sit might be in a really advantageous position because of what you talked about and because of the expected runs on certain position groups ahead of them. Matt Miller today came out and kind of did the math. And I know, I think you and I were both replying to that tweet where when you start to add up the quarterbacks, the offensive tackles and the wide receivers who are generally considered first round locks, you come up with about 20 of those 32 picks, which is going to push cornerbacks down it's a strong class it's going to push all those interior offensive linemen the edge players and and the couple of d uh d tackles that are widely considered to be potential first round picks and that's a direction you went you took advantage of that uh th those groups being pushed down to take an edge player so let's put your your first uh few rounds up here this is rounds one through four you go with chop robinson unbelievable athlete testing through the roof the production hasn't really matched it on the field at Penn State, which is, I think, one of the reasons I hesitate to take him when I do these simulations. What is it about Robinson that you think makes him a good fit? So I look at John Schneider's history first off. When he has an opportunity to get an elite athlete of this caliber, I mean, we are talking top one or two percentile athlete for yeah. edge rushers, Dan. If you have the opportunity to get him at pick number 28, especially considering that Daryl Taylor has minimum guarantees this year, he has one year left in his deal. You haven't seen much from Derek Hall yet at this point. That is still a position beyond 2024 that you're going to be looking to have reinforcements potentially. So if you can get Chop Robinson, a guy who has an upside to be a top five caliber player in this draft, if he puts everything together, and I also looked at more than just sacks. I know a lot of people are looking at the sack numbers, only four and a half sacks for Penn State last year, but he had the 13th highest pass rush win rate of any edge rusher in college football last year. So there is a lot of really good film of this guy being able to use his athleticism, better developed counter moves than you would expect. And his run defense, I think, is really solid for a guy that isn't a big edge setter by any means okay. but he plays with some intensity and you can tell that he prioritizes run defense which has been a huge problem for Daryl Taylor didn't see that on his film coming out of Tennessee and oh by the way the average depth of tackle according to pro football focus for him and it matches the film I've watched it's negative one for last season against the run so wow. he makes a lot of stops in the backfield and that's where that penetrating ability the athleticism comes into play I just think John Schneider, if he traded down that far and he had a chance to get the best player available with the highest upside, Chop Robinson screams selecting there at 28. Yeah, and you know, really all the way up until draft season started, 
you know, Chop Robinson was kind of a consensus top 15, top 20 pick, and he's he's sort of slid lately probably because of the production. A little side question here for you of that edge class. There's some cool players at the top of it, and then it seems to really drop off a cliff sometime during day two. If this were to be the pick, do you think there may be a trade market out there on day three, perhaps for a Daryl Taylor for teams looking for an edge that may have missed out on a guy? I think that that is definitely a possibility. I think Seattle has positioned themselves where if they don't have the right edge, the right time fall to them. Hey, we still believe we can maybe get more out of Daryl Taylor, but the way they restructured that contract, they put the carrot out in front of Daryl Taylor with incentives on sacks, quarterback hits, to go and try to get that, but at the same time, just 20000 in guaranteed money yeah. on that contract. So they've given themselves a very easy out if they decide, you know what, hey, Chop Robinson fell to us here. Hey, teams out there, you want to give us a sixth or a seventh? We will trade him away to you because now we don't need Daryl Taylor. So I think there could be some dominoes there, that edge rusher position, especially because, as you mentioned, I think this might be – the weakest position in the draft class in terms of depth from going from round one and round two to the rest of the draft. I don't think you're going to find much on day three with edge rushers as far as impact guys, especially the ones that are healthy. Jalen Green from James Madison is somebody that I really like, but he's coming off a severe knee injury. So there's just not much depth in this position. If you can get somebody like Chop Robinson early, I think John Schneider is going to practice what he has preached, and that is I'm going to take that best player available, and then we'll rework the roster as such off of that pick. And then in the second round, you go with a guy he's pictured there in the graphic that Seahawk fans have been talking about, thinking about, dreaming on for months because he just seems to be such an obvious pick. Junior Colson, uh, the extremely young and yet experienced middle linebacker, inside linebacker from Michigan. He's as fun of a prospect as you're going to find in this class. And this is another position, linebacker, where I feel a little more optimistic about the depth than what I did, say, a month ago. But it's still not a very deep class, especially if you're looking for pure off-ball linebackers that can cover, defend the run, and blitz. Junior Colson's one of the few guys in this class that can do all three of those things. And, of course, there's the Mike McDonald connection. Yeah. Junior Colson started as a true freshman, a true freshman, not a redshirt freshman, a true freshman for Mike McDonald. year old freshman, yeah. He's, yeah. He's At middle player. linebacker and played at a really high level on a defense that went from being in the 90s the year before to eighth overall in Mike McDonald's only season. The magic that he worked with that group. Junior Colson was a big part of that. And I think where he's improved the most is coverage. He was shaky early on in his time at Michigan. But last year, you could see the athleticism. And oh, by the way, he's 240 plus pounds. So he's built more like a traditional off-ball linebacker. He can thump people in the run game. He's an effective blitzer. This is a guy that I could see potentially going early in round two as the number one linebacker off the board. But I could also see it being a case because the position's been devalued to an extent that he is there at pick number 60 that the Seahawks got from the Bills. And if he is, I think that John Schneider is not going to hesitate. It's going to take two seconds to say, this is who we're picking with this selection. Yeah, and in a draft that has so many overaged guys because of the, the continued COVID effect and NIL, everything else, to to get a guy that at the end of his rookie contract could conceivably conceivably be 25, 26 years old is pretty exciting. Um, yeah, absolutely. Then your next two picks, third round and fourth, fourth round, you double down. This is going to make a lot of fans happy. You double down on what we all agree, I think, is the greatest position in need on this roster. John Schneider just talked about it again this week on his show yesterday. You go Cooper Beebe from Kansas State, Christian Mahogany of Boston College, back-to-back. -back. What is it about these two, uh, their games, that fit being able to play together? First off, I want to go back to John Schneider's process and how that played into these selections because he has never picked a guard earlier than the third round. Right. And I could see that changing this year if somebody like a Troy Fotanu is available to them at 16. John Schneider is going to be jumping at that. That might be one of the few players where he's saying, no, I'm not trading down. I want to get this guy that can really change my offensive line. But he has been adamant publicly that he thinks guards are overdrafted and overpaid. And this would match with the way that he has drafted in the past. And if there's a year where that can really work in your favor, 
this is my bold prediction, Dan. I think there are at least two future all pro offensive linemen in this class that'll be picked on day two or later because <laughs> there is a ton of depth. You've got a lot of guys that can start on day one, and both of these guys fit that bill. Cooper Beebe, this is probably the one pick on this mock draft that I was hesitant to make the selection because I just don't know that he's going to be there at that stage. And yet, this is such a deep draft class that it's yeah. potentially possible that he could fall to the Seahawks at 81. You're talking about a guy that gave up nine total pressures last year. He has started games at tackle as well as both guard spots, so he gives you that positional versatility. He's able to win in the run game, both as a zone and gap blocker. I just think he's one of those guys that's rock solid, can start for you on day one, can play either guard spot in a pinch. And so that gives the Seahawks a lot of flexibility. The tackle background as well, another insurance option there with Abe Lucas's knee and lingering. And as for Mahogany, little different style player. He's not going to be one of those guys that's going to be driving dudes off the line of scrimmage all the time. BB is capable of doing that. Mahogany is more of a technician, but I could see his athleticism. Both these guys have enough athleticism to be able to run your pulling guard assignments, to get them out on sweeps, can you get to the second level? Maybe not the most athletic guards in this class, but they're both capable of doing that. Both really smart players that play with sound technique, especially Mahogany. And I think Mahogany's got a little more room to grow. He's got a higher ceiling, whereas I feel like the high floor is Cooper Beebe with a little bit of room to grow. But he's going to come in as a very polished prospect. Both these guys could start for you on day one at minimum. Anthony Bradford, if you want to start next year, you're going to get pushed by one of these rookies at that right guard spot. Mahogany's fun to watch because of how quick he gets out of his stance. Really, really impressive, especially on inside runs, just how quickly he can get up and seal off a guy. And and BB, for all of the prospects that try to cut weight for the combine and it doesn't really work in their favor, I'm thinking of Braylon Trice and there, there are others. You know, he's listed at 335. I think he had this this perception among most people that you know, of a big kind of lumbering mauler. And then he shows up at the combine at 322 and he runs a five flat 40 and 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 really kind of kills it uh athletically. Uh may have helped himself there by doing that. He's then, a better athlete than a lot of people were yeah. talking about. You can see it on film. He might not be the most explosive guy. I do have reservations, the people that were wanting to move him to tackle. I don't think he has quite enough athleticism to handle. NFL edge rushers, but in a phone booth at guard, uh, he, he's as good as they come. And again, nine pressures all of last year in the Big 12 where they throw the ball a lot. And then we've heard the name McKinley Jackson a lot because he's one of one of the few defensive tackles in this class that has played some nose and, and has that bigger frame. What do you like about him? Well, I like the motor first off. This is a guy that when you turn on – and Texas A&M, if you watch their defense, this is one of the reasons Jimbo Fisher is no longer employed. They had major issues with consistency from a motor and effort standpoint. But this is one of those guys that didn't have that problem. McKinley Jackson can eat up double teams. He can dominate on single blocks as well. He is that natural, traditional nose tackle. And there's a lot of athleticism that doesn't show up in the testing. When I'm looking at nose tackles, I'm not worried about 40-yard dash times and things of that nature. I'm looking for a guy that can get – out of his stance quick and has the ability to penetrate when you ask him to, to split gaps. And McKinley Jackson can do that. What I was concerned about with his film is I didn't see enough consistency rushing the passer. And so that could limit him to early downs, even though I think the upside is there for him to be one of those rare traditional nose tackles that can be a factor rushing the passer just didn't have the pressure and sack numbers you'd expect with his size and athleticism. So that's going to be up to whoever drafts him to be able to unlock that potential. I think the efforts there, he puts in the work from everything I've heard, a, a good teammate as well. So I think if you can get him in the fourth round, that's really good value. And who better to learn from than Jonathan Hankins, who's been a pretty solid nose tackle in the NFL for a decade. And certainly when you think about where we were this time a year ago with that defensive line and we were all worried heading into the draft, not enough depth there. You add him to that group and, and suddenly you're, you're starting to see some layers. Yep. Then we go to day uh, day three and uh, you you had made another trade along the way. You said you were going to with the Dolphins move down and pick up a couple of more picks. And then we address the safety situation. And this is a guy I was listening to your podcast 
Locked on Seahawks the other day that you had seen, uh, you were watching a game three years ago and he stood out to you early in his career. Yeah, Malik Mustafa, I have, that has been a name that's been on the tip of my tongue now for three seasons. I was watching him against Notre Dame, who had a top 10 team at that point. And I was just watching him like, who is this number three? Who is this short, squatty guy that just keeps making big hits? He had an interception in that game, had a pass breakup, had a sack. I mean, he had one of the most complete games I've seen from a safety. And his overall numbers are not as impressive as some of the other safeties in this class. But every time I watch Wake Forest, number three just pops off the screen. And you're talking about a guy that also played on a defense that had a lot of holes in the ACC that he was trying to make up for, had to be really aggressive. That led to more missed tackles. But I think this is a guy that can play both safety spots. He can play nickel. He is an elite blitzer. We know how much Mike McDonald prioritizes that from all over the board. So I view him as the guy that you lean more towards free safety, but he has that positional versatility Mike McDonald wants and could be a long-term starter eventually replacing Quandre Diggs that gives you more of the ability to play in the box than what Diggs did. And then John Schneider talked a week and a half or so ago about their draft process and how, you know, he talks about best player available. Uh, he, he kind of clarified that a little bit. He's talking early in the draft, but later, day three, says they absolutely look at their roster and look at need. And here's one. The departure of DJ Dallas leaves a void in that running back room, even though we like the top three guys. This is a class that doesn't have a lot of buzz around it. So it, as I'm doing mock drafts, I usually just bypass it because I haven't studied the class that well. But looking at this kid, the nation's leading rusher, Kamani Vidal, um, kind of reminds me, maybe not so much stylistically, although there are some some plays on tape that you see, but but his frame and the way he moves, a little bit of Thomas Rawls in this guy. That is the, who I've been throwing out there as the comp. I see a more disciplined Thomas Rawls. And Sometimes that worked in Rawls' favor. A lot of times it didn't. He was such an aggressive runner that sometimes he would miss blocks. Sometimes he would miss the opportunity for cutback lanes. And that ended up being part of the reason his career was shortened along with the fact he just wasn't quite the same after his ankle injury. But yeah. you see the same physical, tenacious running style, same build from Kamani Vidal, he is one of those guys that if he has a chance to go out of bounds, he's going to pass up on that and he's going to try to truck whoever's coming after him. And it's really fun to watch. He was second in the nation last year in missed tackles forced, according to Pro Football Focus. And you turn on the you turn on the tape and he does it all kinds of ways. He jukes guys out. He runs over people. He breaks arm tackles. He is just a yards after contact maestro. But the reason that I'm picking him in this mock draft, I know a lot of Seahawks fans are like, we've picked a running back in the second round the last two years. Why waste another pick? You can never have too many running backs. Do you remember 2017 and 2018, what the Seahawks had to deal with, with their injuries? Yeah. And we haven't seen Kenny McIntosh yet play in a regular season game. I want competition to go against him. And if he earns a third down job, great. But Kamani Vidal would be a really difficult player for him to beat out because this guy is the best pass protecting running back that I have scouted in 10 years, Dan. He is the best. And there's tape going out around viral from Jim Nagy, my good friend, senior bowl director. This guy just decks people. He's really technically sound. He's aggressive in pass pro. He's got soft hands, catches most throws his direction and didn't get a lot of opportunities, but I just think he's a complete back. If you're looking for somebody to replace DJ Dallas that can also push Kenny McIntosh, if not beat him out, uh, Kamani Vidal, in fact, I would predict Kamani Vidal beats him out for the third down job if he gets drafted by the Seahawks. Yeah, and that pass pro is a big, big factor. Saw some of those clips the other day. It's pretty impressive. And the thing I like about him, too, he, he has the ability to bounce outside and 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 run cutback plays, but when uh, and they ran a lot of read option at Troy, from what I see on tape, when when the hole's there, he just hits it and goes north south and doesn't. As around. I like to say, he does not piss around. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, and then we address the tight end position. You know, I think there's a lot of excitement that Noah Fant uh, coming back. They paid for him. That maybe he'll be featured a little bit more in this offense. Farrell Brown, more of a blocking type profile. Uh, Tip Ryman was a guy I wasn't familiar with out of Illinois, and then you watch him at the combine. He was one of the 
biggest, maybe the biggest tight end there overall. Um, and a guy that was at his size, 6'5", 271, much, much more athletic than you would think just watching him step off the bus. This is one of those prospects that you have to really look at the environment he was in while you're trying to make an assessment of his numbers. His, his pass catching numbers overall, nothing overly impressive, wasn't a featured piece, but look at who he had throwing the football to him. No offense to Tommy DeVito, who had his one night in the limelight beating the Green Bay Packers last year as the Giants quarterback. But you look at Tommy DeVito's college career, there was nothing overly impressive about that. This was a run-first offense, and Tip Ryman had his moments as a blocker, but didn't get a lot of chances to catch the football. When he did, however, we're talking about a guy that averaged over 12 yards per reception in one of his college seasons – created a lot of yards after the catch with that more athletic profile than we expected. So I look at him as a player that is a more athletic version of Will Disley, where Will Disley didn't get a lot of chances being a converted defensive lineman at Washington, but came in the league and had better hands than advertised. I could see Tip Ryman being a late round pick that can develop into a really good starter in the right system where his skill set is more accentuated than it was at Illinois. And I expect he's going to be able to block at a high level at his size as well. So I think this is a really good value pick with some projection in the sixth round. And then with the last pick in your draft in the sixth round, another safety. You know, at this point in the draft, you're looking at special teams. You're looking at upside. Uh, Dominic Hampton, though, 6'2", 215, looked good in the combine, led the Huskies in tackles last year. How would he fit this Mike McDonald system? So there's going to be some people that look, and I, I saw some comments on this when I posted the mock draft a few days ago. Why are we picking two safeties? Well, look at your contract situation at safety. Julian loves a free agent after this year. He was a pro bowler, but last year I think was more hit and miss. If you really go back and look at the start of the year, especially he struggled a lot. And then you've got Rayshon Jenkins on a two-year deal that really is a one-year deal. Let's see what you can do. And then if you're good, we'll give you your second year. And then Kayvon Wallace is another one-year prove-it deal at near veteran minimum. I mean, the Seahawks do not have long-term answers right now on the roster at safety. That's why Mustafa, and in this case, Hampton, a guy that ran a sub 4-5 at Washington's Pro Day. He wasn't happy with a 4-5-1 of the combine, ran faster at Washington's Pro Day at his size. He's had a few injuries in his career, but this is a guy that really put everything together last season. And even though Ryan Grubb's an offensive coach, he's going to know Dominique Hampton from playing against him at practice. And this is a guy that was one of the leaders of that Huskies defense. So I think he's more of your box safety, but he can do a number of different things, and he has the athleticism to move him around some. Both these safeties are chess pieces that I could see those two and Jarek Reed really being the future of the Seahawks with those three safety looks, and all those guys can play different positions. So this is about scheme and some of the personnel differences we are going to see with Mike McDonald compared to Pete Carroll. That's why I think this is a really good value pick in round six, doubling up on safeties. And sometimes when I see those fan reactions to things like this, I, I think sometimes we're stuck in old habits and we're afraid to look outside the box. And we think in very traditional terms, you have a free and a strong, you have two corners, you have a slot corner that's a specific profile, and then you have your inside linebackers. And that's not necessarily the way that, that guys are running defenses these days, especially with the, the new direction in the league where everyone's trying to copy Mike McDonald's scheme. Now it's about interchangeability and, and, more safeties are playing slot and i've even seen some some uh some scouting reports even indicate they think hampton could play some outside corner so yeah that versatility seems to be something that uh that gets lost on some people let me ask you this when you were thinking about your first round pick before you took Jock, chop robinson was there another name or two that you really struggled with that that made it a hard decision so I tried to approach this as if I was in the war room and at pick 16, I was trying to decide what I was going to do. And there were a couple names at pick 16 that could be available that I was considering. I, I'm higher on Jackson Powers Johnson than a lot of people are. There's been this new report that media and uh, scouts are more excited about him than what teams are. That is not what I was hearing in Indianapolis, but that was a guy that I considered there, but I was like, hey, if I can trade down and still maybe get him, it was worth the risk to me. The one name I was struggling with, though, and 
this is what I said in yesterday's Locked on Seahawks. This is my Devin Witherspoon for this year. It's a player that few were talking about that I could absolutely see John Snyder saying, you know what, this is the best player available. He fits Mike McDonald's scheme. Cooper DeJean from Iowa. Yeah. yeah. You watch the film. I think you can make an argument that this is one of the top five players in this entire draft class. That That's just my opinion. But he's a corner or a safety, and he's coming off a leg injury, didn't run at the combine. There are going to be teams that are going to push him down the board some. But, I mean, my goodness, he had three pick sixes in one season two years ago. And in that same season, he missed a grand total of three tackles. He's 6'1", almost 210 pounds. So he's got the build to play either safety spot. He's an aggressive downhill player. He can play outside corner. He can play slot because he's a really – I mean, I think if you ran into the combine, he's probably a 4'3", low 4'4 guy. He is really athletic. So you're talking about the ultimate Swiss Army knife. Could you imagine him and Devin Witherspoon in the same secondary, the fun stuff that Mike McDonald could do with all the pre-snap disguises that he likes to initiate? So that was a name that I strongly considered at pick 16. That's how much Hmm. I like him and how much I think the Seahawks will like him. I think Mike look at him more. That is is a more athletic – more ball, uh, more ball hawking version of Kyle Hamilton. Give me so that is the name this year that I'm throwing out there. I'm not saying the Seahawks are going to pick him, but if they did, I would not be surprised at all. I've been telling people for weeks if you're if you're if you want to prepare yourself for for a surprise, think about corner because as we touched on at the beginning of the show. That's a position group that's strong, but it could get pushed down because of these runs on other positions. And it's very likely I could see John looking up at his board and going, huh, top of our board, right? I could see Quinion Mitchell potentially being pushed down in their range, and he's getting Devin Witherspoon comps. Like it's prepare for the unexpected, is what I tell fans. Cause man, people didn't think we'd take a corner at five last year. Imagine the reaction if we went back to back. To I, I back. think it would have to be a corner that has safety value for mm. them to do that. I don't see that with Quinion Mitchell, but yeah. uh, Cooper John, I actually think his best bet in the NFL is playing that hybrid safety slot position where you just move him all over the place. Right? He blitz him some, something that mm. I wouldn't do because he was an outside corner, but like I, I'm thoroughly convinced he could do Oh, by the way, he was one of the most dangerous punt returners in the country too. So if you want to use him on special teams too, uh, you can put him in that capacity. He is just a damn good football player. And and that's what Devin Witherspoon was last year. I'm telling you, I would not be surprised, Dan, if they picked him. I'm just saying it, whether it's 16 or trading down, I know the O-line is the big glaring weakness, but John Schneider, I think, and and this is just going off a different tangent here, Dan, but I – I kind of get the sense, and John Schneider said yesterday on his radio show that Pete Carroll very rarely ever tried to butt in on personnel decisions. But like, yeah. I just feel like you look at the last two drafts. It all I felt I thought this when Pete Carroll when they let him go, it felt like the last two years that the draft there were some noticeable changes with the way that they were doing things, and it makes me wonder if John Schneider was really pulling all the strings the last two years. They were drafting more developed power five offensive linemen instead of projects. And they were bringing in, uh, you know, more established guys on the first two days. They were still going after their athletic freaks on day three. That is a really good practice, but it just felt like there were some subtle changes in the way they were doing things and going after Devin Witherspoon last year. Hey, I'm just going to get the best damn football player I can get here at five. I could see Cooper DeJean or Jerzon Newton, who is one of my absolute favorite prospects in this draft. You can't tell me John Schneider isn't in love with him. He already interviewed him at the Combine, put him back with Devin Witherspoon. I mean, those kind of guys that are freak athletes and outstanding playmakers, all-around playmakers, those might not be viewed as areas of need, but if you have a chance to get one of those guys – John Schneider is not going to bat an eye, and Mike McDonald isn't going to bat an eye. He just wants damn good players on defense. So those are two names. They might not be the biggest areas of need, but yeah. they are guys that could threaten to play right away for you and be stars in the league. Saw some of those clips you were posting on Johnny Newton. He's a fun player. Uh, oh, he, you- is. he is. Yeah. I, this is this is my. I wrote the scouting. You said that, that that guard he, has a family. 
<laughs> this was how I led my scouting report because when I watch him, I was thinking, God, you know, we've seen butcher ball of, of, of knives. We've seen all kinds of different things. He is an atom that is looking to decombust every single play. You're just waiting for that explosion. That's the kind of guy that we're looking at there. So, yes, I love me some Johnny Newton. I, I think he's a top 10 player in this draft. And I don't care if some view him as undersized. He weighed in at 304 at the combine. He's more than big enough to wreak havoc in the NFL. Before I let you go, let me ask you this, kind of get your latest thoughts on this because it's a subject that won't go away. Every week on his show, he's asked about it and asked to clarify it. It's it's that guard position, and here you double up in this draft on a couple of guys you think can be plug-and-play as rookies. Uh, they've been linked to Lakin Tomlinson, Cody Whitehair. They had Greg Van Roten in for a visit this week. Do you think? Uh, do you sense that that's doing due diligence in the event that the draft doesn't go the way they want? They would sign one of these guys after the draft. Do you, do you think they'll add one prior? I would lean seventy five twenty five. That this this is kind of doing their due diligence to make sure that they have a backup plan if the draft does not unfold the way they want to. I mean, look at the salary cap. It's not like the Seahawks have a lot of flexibility to be able to sign a veteran right now on the offensive line anyway. And I think that's probably part of the approach with these free agent visits is, hey, we'd like to add a veteran, but we're not going to rush into doing this. And as far as the players they brought in, it's interesting. You look at the stats, you would think Lake and Tomlinson is the one that you'd be most scared of because he gave up seven sacks last year. But if you watch that New York Jets offense after Aaron Rodgers went down, I don't know how you could play offensive line on that team, yeah. especially with the injuries they had at tackle. Tomlinson got put in some really bad spots. Two years ago, he was really solid still. I, I think he's a guy that could be a good fit. Van Roten is kind of like fine wine. He has aged really well. Yeah. And he's playing his best football. White hair is the one that would scare me. He looked done when I watched Chicago's tape mm. last year. I just don't, he does not look to me like a guy that. You know, maybe as backup insurance, but I'm definitely not bringing him in thinking, yeah, oh, that guy's going to start for me this year. So uh, they're kicking the tires on guys that are on free agency for a reason at this stage. And you'd have to think that those are backup plans more than anything. Corbin Smith, locked on Seahawks, all Seahawks. What do you got coming up on your show uh, today and uh, in the near future? So Nick Lee and I are going to be diving into a bunch of trade down possibilities now that we have more clarity on which teams late in the first round could be very aggressive to want to move up to get pick 16. And we're wrapping up our Seahawks alumni March Madness tournament to see which school that has had Seahawks stars is going to get the first ever championship today. So that should be a lot of fun leading into the final four in Phoenix this weekend. All right. Thanks for hopping on again. Enjoy the rest of this draft month. I know you're a busy, busy guy. We'll catch up again after the draft. Sounds good, man. Thanks. All right. Be sure to follow me on Twitter at Seahawks forever, because really that's sort of the hub of all my engagement. So you're always going to see links to audio episodes and new shows there. I'm going to take the weekend off and then jump back into it again next week with, uh, with more draft previews and coverage. Got some cool guests lined up. Uh, Be sure to check out the last episode as well. Love the conversation that I had with Jackson Bevins of cigar thoughts Um, Always really appreciate his insight, and I think you will too. Check it out. Until next time, forever and always, go Hawks. Thanks for watching. 